Hello and welcome to the Long Range Endurance Platform Systems Engineering presentation. My name is Sean Tavanjan and I am the Systems Engineering Team Lead. The team consists of myself, Francisco Padilla, Carolina Rosales, Brianna Talamantes, and Summer Tirado. Our advisor is Mr. David Scholler and our client is the Aerospace Corporation with Dr. Allison Yarborough serving as their liaison. Here we have the agenda of our presentations, which contains all the topics we are going to be discussing today. The long range endurance platform has been divided into four sub teams, each with their respective responsibilities. The systems engineering and payload team is responsible for designing and analyzing the telemetry, tracking and communication system, as well as developing a sensors payload suite capable of completing the missions set by the team for the platform. Structures is responsible for the design and analysis of the UAV structure. Powertrain is responsible for the design and analysis of the UAV's powertrain. And flight team is responsible for the design and analysis of the propellers, wings, and to develop the flight characteristics of the system. Okay, so what is systems engineering? In short, systems engineering is asking you and your team, how can we accomplish this project's objective in the most efficient way possible? This includes reducing the amount of unnecessary work, catching potential problems early, and communicating effectively as a team so that everyone is working toward the same common goal. Systems engineering starts off at first by approaching a complex objective or project and decomposing it into smaller, more workable tasks. As you decompose the project, new problems will arise. What is the most efficient way to break down the tasks? How can we ensure the final pieces are compatible? Since when they are built, often in different areas, different times, and by different people, we must ensure they meet the objective of the project. This requires communicating the requirements, constraints, and objective all around. And as the project progresses, we need to ensure any potential problem that arises is dealt with effectively. And lastly, does the result meet the stakeholders' expectations? I mean, are they satisfied with the outcome? First, we examine the stakeholder needs which in this case is the Aerospace Corporation. And this stage is where we get the idea of what the result should look like and what it should do. Second, we begin diving into the design aspect. This is where we brainstorm ideas, how many rotors should the aircraft have, how fast are we aiming to design the UAV. It's important to conduct analysis to examine the pros and cons of each design and eliminate the weakest ones to determine a preliminary concept. Our project's final outlook is what was shown a couple slides ago. Once that's determined, we move on to the performance requirements of the aircraft. We're designing this aircraft to handle what type of environment conditions. The structures team determined material and conducted analysis on the aircraft in the proposed environment. This mission will take place at the Port of Los Angeles at the beachfront. What if it's windy? What if there's fog? Based on these conditions, what safety values are we designing this aircraft based on the severity of the consequences? Essentially a risk rating assessment. Then, we overlook the functionality of the aircraft. Obviously, the aircraft must maintain its build. The power must be stored and distributed appropriately among its components. We must ensure the aircraft is always able to communicate with the ground. Once we determined all these, we could begin the manufacturing of the aircraft, as well as the integration and testing. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we were restricted with the physical access to begin the manufacturing until the very end of this year. But assuming we planned the front end design process correctly, we would have mitigated the amount of problems that would have taken place without it. Mission requirement and mission profile requirements. General UAV requirements set up by the customer at Aerospace Corporation include that the UAV design must maintain physical parameters given by the client itself. The UAV must have the capacity to assess particle emissions from marine vessels and vehicles. Uh, the design must also maintain at least an eight hour flight time. The design must also maintain a duty cycle of 60% sensing, 20% landing, 20% taking off. It must be utilized in other port related missions, including infrastructure inspection, security, emergency services, and real time data recovery and assessment is required. There are certain FAA regulations that need to be met in order to operate a UAV over 55 pounds. First, we must register the UAV. Next, there are certain waivers that need, we need to apply to. The night flying waiver, 107.29. Daylight operation is required if flying past sunset. 
Anti-collision lights that meet visibility for at least three statute miles is needed for filing waiver 107.29. Waiver 107.31, visual line of sight aircraft operations, is also very important if we lose sight of the aircraft. Waiver 107.33, use a visual observer without following all visual observer requirements. Waiver 107.35, operations of multiple small UAS. 107.145, operations over moving vehicles. Waiver 107.39, operations over people, and waiver 107.51, operating limitations for small unmanned aircrafts if needed to surpass speed of 100 miles per hour or fly above 400 feet. The mass budgets. So throughout the year, as mentioned earlier, problems did actually arise, specifically with the team's mass budgets. The initial proposed mass budgets per team changed throughout the year as we realized certain teams needed flexible mass budgets while other teams not so much. For example, the powertrain needed a higher budget as they were dealing with heavier components such as the engine, the battery packs, and the fuel. The remaining three teams were forecasting much smaller weight expectations so the budgets were rearranged as shown. System and structures team with 20% of the overall weight each, powertrain with half of the overall weight, while flight only accounted for 10%. We are expecting an overall weight of about a hundred pounds. We also forecasted the overall expected expenses for this project at nearly $19,000. This entire expense includes the sensors, the gimbal, and the payload for the systems team, the aircraft materials for the structures team, engine and battery for the power team, and the wings and propellers for the flight team. Fortunately, we did not receive a cost budget from the stakeholders, so the entire team was able to research freely without this constraint holding us back. The primary mission for this platform is the detection of particulate emissions from maritime vessels entering into the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of Long Beach. Through GPS data and government regulations, it was determined that all large maritime vessels are required to enter the two ports via the north, south, and east-west passages. With the location of the passages determined and the live location of the ships obtained from GPS data, the platform will be able to intercept any incoming vessels for pollution detection and security inspection purposes. The images in this slide show maritime density maps highlighting the north, south, and east-west passages, as well as up-to-date locations of all target vessels. Protocol for the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of Long Beach dictates that ships must wait in Anchorage before entering the port to unload or load their cargo, essentially a parking lot for ships. Anchorages have been set up by the port authorities to accommodate the number of ships entering the port. However, due to the ongoing pandemic, the backlog of ships at the port have drastically increased, so much so that the extra anchorages have been allocated to accommodate them. The image on the left is a density map illustrating the anchorages in 2019, and the image on the right is the same density map with the current location of the ships waiting in Anchorage. The extra anchorages, along with the increased distance from the port, substantially increases the distance and time at which the UAV has to fly. This slide shows average distances and flight paths of four of the primary mission paths. Dock inspection, which monitors the ships docked at port that are loading and unloading their cargo. Passage monitoring, which involves the security and surveillance of the passage entrances, as well as intercepting any incoming vessel for monitoring and Anchorage inspection flight paths, which have been constructed for usual maritime traffic as well as extended missions for current backlog of ships due to the pandemic. The port mission table shows the average cruise times, hover times, average total flight time, and distance for the four primary missions. Cruise times were calculated using the flight team's efficiency analysis calculation of 25 nautical miles, and hover times were determined based on the time required to gather pollution and imaging data. The mission matrix was created to cross-reference the required components needed for each mission that the UAV can assist in. As shown in the table, there are a total of five possible mission scenarios. From the table, all missions would require an optical and thermal camera or a landing sensors and components would vary based on the specific task of the UAV. In the future, an additional column that includes the total price per payload will be included to help assess the initial cost of each mission. In some instances, it may be significantly cost-effective to only have the design operate, while in others a combination of both human and UAV operation may result in a greater cost or greater efficiency.
Our team began an emission analysis in order to assist the UAV in differentiating between the vessel exhaust it should be measuring and its own engine exhaust. To your left, you can see the composition of typical vessel exhaust. And it consists of nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxides, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and additional hydrocarbons including gas, soot, and other particulates. Although carbon dioxide is not considered a violating gas for marine vessels in Southern California, uh, there is a speed restriction of 12, knot 12 knots for vessels within 20 miles of the coast as excessive speed is considered a contributing factor for the excessive carbon dioxide that is produced by marine vessels. To your right, you can see a flow process and typical gas composition from a two-stroke diesel engine manufactured by MAN B and W diesel. Generally, this engine is found in most modern commercial vessels. You can also see the composition of the exhaust gas in volume percentages and volumetric parts per million. In terms of volumetric parts per million, generally that can be converted to parts per million, which is what our chosen sensors will measure by multiplying by the corresponding density of the gas. Continuing with our emission analysis, our team also considered the composition of the UAV exhaust, assuming the design would utilize a Wankel rotary engine. Generally, for rotary engines, there is a higher NOx uh, emission level compared to other UAV engines. There is also a low SOx emission level and a higher CO2 emission level. Its power consumption is about 22 kilowatts or 29.9 horsepower at 6,000 RPM, and it utilizes regular unleaded gasoline. Generally, unleaded gasoline contains less than 10 parts per million of SOx emissions and 30 parts per million of NOx emissions. Therefore, for future analysis of the emission factors and SOx factors, sulfur oxide in the UAV exhaust would not be as big of a concern as the higher nitrogen oxide levels because of the confusion that may cause uh, in both of the exhausts. In order to accomplish the mission set by this team, a series of sensors were identified as crucial to the success of this platform. The four sensors that the team identified as being invaluable were an optical and thermal imaging camera, a LiDAR light detecting and ranging sensor, a particulate emission detection sensor, and a CO2 emission detection sensor. The systems team's original proposal was to integrate all of the sensors into the top dome of the UAV. However, through further analysis, it was determined that, the, that designing a lower sensors bay to accommodate the sensors would be more beneficial in succeeding the mission. The three-axis gimbal mounted on the bottom of the UAV platform is designed in order to give the sensors a clear line of sight regardless of the orientation of the UAV. For our camera, we decided to go with the FLIR Hadron for its unique capabilities of capturing HD and thermal imaging, as opposed to a majority of cameras on the market that specialize in only one. The camera is suitable for identifying objects in dim conditions, and its compact and lightweight design enables us to mount within the gimbal as needed. LiDAR S3 was chosen as the primary sensor for the aircraft. LiDAR is an acronym for Light Detection and Ranging. It is essentially a remote sensing method that utilizes lasers to measure elevation data, generating accurate 3D information regarding the Earth's surface at a very fast rate. Some key advantages of the LiDAR S3 is that it is best used for wide area mapping providing a field of view of 120 degrees horizontally and vertically. Having a long range of 150 meters, the LiDAR system also has the strong capability to examine both natural and man-made environments in several weather conditions without sacrificing high accuracy and precision. The LiDAR S3 is very low in cost and also lightweight and compact in size. There are several ways to collect LiDAR data. In this project, we will be focusing on airborne LiDAR data. 
airborne LiDAR data system contains four components, beginning with the LiDAR unit, which scans the large geographical area from side to side, the GPS, which tracks the altitude and location of the aircrafts and is vital to attaining accurate elevation data. The IMU, which tracks the orientation, allowing high accuracy of the position of the poles. This is important as the laser pulses are emitted from the scanner in various angles. The computer then gathers the elevation data as the LiDAR unit scans the surfaces, providing accurate 3D images of the Earth's surface. How it works. LiDAR emits laser pulses and measures the time it takes from the moment the pulse leaves the scanner, reflects off a detected object, whether it be the ground, trees, or a building, and returns back to the scanner. To determine the distance, the LiDAR system records the time it takes for the pulse to travel to an object and return back to the sensor, timesing this by the speed of light and dividing by two, since the pulse traveled to the object and back, we can then calculate the distance between the top of the object and the aircraft. Determining the ground elevation is also very important. We find this by subtracting the altitude by the distance, which we know how to find with the equation above. Sensors, particulate and TO2. What is a particulate sensor encounter? Generally, there are t three types of particulate sensors, infrared, beta attuation, and laser scattering. In our instance, we chose laser scattering as it utilizes laser diffraction to count the number of particles and determine their size. And how it works is a laser beam strikes a particle and the light and the beam's light is scattered. Then the sensor detects the intensity and angle of the beam after passing through the particulate laden air. And then an algorithm determines how many particles were in the sample and their size. For a CO2 sensor, there are also three types of sensors including an NDIR, or non-dispersive infrared sensor, electrochemical, and metal oxide semiconductor. In our instance, we chose a non-dispersive infrared because it utilizes specific wavelengths of light to measure the amount of CO2 in the air. And how it works is an, an air, uh, air enters the sensor, and then the sensor will activate a light set on one of the specific wavelengths for the gas, while the other side holds a receptive bulb that will measure how much light makes it across. And then once the light is activated, any CO2 in the air sample will absorb the beams of light. Generally, the more CO2 that is present, the more light that will be absorbed. Our focus on choosing the laser scattering and the NDIR sensors include the actual size of the sensors, their accuracy to a thousand parts per million as that is how uh, the NOx and SOx emission violations are defined, and also the ability to quantify the number of particles in the sample, because in terms of uh, violation fines, the larger the number of particles are in the sample of gases, the larger the fine will be for the violating vessels. Shown below are our top three contenders for the particulate sensor choices that our team made. First sensor depicted is the Aerocall S500, sensor only, which is illustrated with the black arrow up top. Second choice was the Prana Air PM 2.5 sensor, and choice three was the X-Type VP300 particulate counter, sensor only, also illustrated with the black arrow. Choice one and three are part of a handheld device um, and the Aerocall S500 uh, sensor also uh, required that we utilize their specific uh, software in order to uh, count and review the data. Although it is designed for real-time surveying of common outdoor air pollutants, and many Fortune 500 companies utilize both the software and the equipment for their uh, outdoor air pollutant measurements. Uh, it also had an interchangeable sensor head, 
So you could use one monitoring system for uh, over five pollutants. And then the sensor heads utilize active fan sampling, which increased the measurement accuracy. Uh, according to many reviews, this type of sensor was actually one of the most accurate sensors on the market for outdoor air pollutant measurements. Uh, second choice here uh, use, utilizes laser-based ba laser -based scattering principle with advanced algorithms. It's also fully calibrated digital output for particulate number and mass concentration values. And it has a 10-year expected life with continuous operation of 24 hours a day. And then the third choice uh, options include six particulate size channels. So it could measure any anything between uh, 50 parts per million to 200 parts per million. It could store up to 5,000 records, including data, time, and counts. And it is intended for tasks involving traffic-related emissions. Important factors that led us to choosing the sensor included the size and its ability to accurately uh, count the number of parts per million in the sample, and therefore our choice was the Prana PM 2.5 sensor. Um, unfortunately, it would just take too much time uh, or it would be too costly to have to remove the sensors from the handheld devices in order to utilize the sensors that were shown in choices one and three, and therefore our team felt that it would be easier to implement choice two and integrate it into the existing choices uh, for uh, CO2 sensors and camera options. Shown below are top two contenders for the CO2 sensor that will be implemented into our UAV design. The first choice on the left is the K33 ELG sensor, which is known for its low power consumption, uh, which can be reduced to less than 52 microamps. It is also maintenance free and has a sensor life of over 10 years. Second choice is a Keeley Senva uh, outside air CO2 sensor, which is known for its auto calibration feature uh, internal heat for reliable outdoor operation and a 15 plus year life expectancy on the actual two, on the actual CO2 sensor itself. It's important to note that this sensor also has a digital display that can be seen in the picture. Important factors that influence our decision include the size of the actual sensor, the cost, and its, abil its ability to easily be implemented into uh, the existing uh, pay, uh, payload bay and also the ability to work well with other existing payload components. Based on these factors, our decision was the Keeley Senva uh, outside air CO2 sensor for two reasons. First, the auto calibration feature is very important in a CO2 sensor as CO2 sensors generally require more frequent calibration than other uh, particulate sensors. Uh, two, also the internal heater for reliable outdoor operation. Uh, relative humidity tends to be an important factor in the accuracy of uh, CO2 sensors. Uh, therefore, uh, an internal heater would allow for greater accuracy in very humid uh, environments like those that you would find if you were operating the UAV along the coast. Therefore, the Keeley Senva CO2 sensor would best be applicable to the marine vessel emissions operation our UAV uh, will participate in. Hello, my name is Summer Torado, and today I will be presenting to you on the TTNC system as well as some link analysis I performed on the UAV. When considering the TTNC design, it's important to consider the government rules and regulations to ensure we're not breaking any while designing our system. So what I have for you are some FCC rules and regulations that are most applicable to our UAV. First, in part 15, it applies to RF devices operating at unlicensed frequencies. If we were to violate this rule, we would be charged a $16,000 fine per day. 
The second rule listed regulates accessories and equipment on the platform. This is important when considering our payload design. Some accessories are advertised to operate at power levels higher than allowed by the Commission's rules for telecommand and motocraft. In correlation to this rule, the next rule below states that violators of the previous may be subject to penalties authorized by the Communications Act including but not limited to substantial monetary fines of up to $19,000 per day and up to $147,000 for ongoing violations. What I have for you here are two block diagrams of how the ground station and the UAV will be working together simultaneously. So essentially what we have going on here is that our data acquisition system will begin to gather information and data from the radar, LIDAR, and particulate sensors, as well as the IR camera and the optical camera. From there, the data will be fed into the flight controller CPU. That data will then be sent through the transmitter, through the antenna, received from the receiver antenna of the ground station into the receiver into the ground station computer. Then signal will be sent back to the UAV via the transmitter from the ground station antenna, received into the receiver antenna, back to the flight controller. While this is happening, the flight controller will be sending data to the transducer that will be linked to air traffic control so we can know exactly where we are in the sky, remain on our mission path, and avoid any collisions. On the next side, I have the transreceiver principal model of the UAV, as well as the transreceiver principal model of the ground station. As you can see in the flowchart of the transmitter and receiver, our system begins by receiving the telemetry signal. Next, the signal undergoes pulse cold modulation. PCM coding digitally represents the sampled analog signals from the sensors. They're sampled at regular intervals and quantized to the nearest value. Then the signal will go through encryption as a safety precaution. We want to ensure that only authorized personnel can view our data and information being gathered. Specifically, we will be using AES encryption. Next is channel coding. This process will detect and correct any bit errors found in the system. We then have signal multiplexing. Multiplexing allows us to save weight on the platform by avoiding the use of multiple transmitters and receivers. It combines multiple signals into one signal over a shared medium. Specifically, we are going to use orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. OFDM was selected because it has the ability to cope with high frequency attenuation, narrowband interference, and frequency selective fading due to its multipath. Next is a form of amplitude modulation. This is important to reduce the electricity being wasted. The signal then goes through differential space-time block code. This allows the wireless transmissions to be sent through harsh environments that would cause the signal to become scattered, reflected, refracted, etc. Then we have DSTBC and STBC. These combine all copies of the received signal to extract as much information from them as possible. The signal then travels through the antenna to the receiver of the ground station. The ground station would receive the signal from the transmitter of the platform, begin DTSC decoding, and then undergo frequency domain equalization to mitigate inter-symbol interference. Channel decoding would then begin to detect, detect and correct bit errors in the system. The signal will undergo decryption to get the data, PCM decoding, until we have the signal and it will undergo this process over and over again and relay data back and forth between the ground station and the platform. What we have here are pictures of the AP 10.2 automatic flight control system that we decided to use for our UAV. It is equipped with a central processing unit, a Pateau tube, a GPS unit, an onboard telemetry unit, and an SD, servo SD3 drive. When making this ultimate decision, we did have to make a system change from using 2.4 GHz to 928 MHz. Ultimately, this decision was made because we realized that at 2.4 GHz, we would not be able to reach the same distance that a 928 MHz frequency would allow us to. If we did want to reach that distance, we would have to use multiple antennas, which would then affect the weight of our UAV and also affect the flight because of the positioning of where the antennas would be. Now, something brought up was that the 928 MHz antenna is a much larger antenna. However, after our analysis, we noticed that adding multiple antennas would end up increasing the mass much more than a single 928 MHz antenna. Another question brought up while making this decision was whether we would experience more interference. 
After some research, we did find that 928 megahertz is not often used in the port of Long Beach, so we would not experience very much interference at all. Capabilities of the AP 10.2 is that its an entire system is included, so we can be sure that it will work cohesively throughout the entire flight. It has a 100 kilometer line of sight, which is e approximately equal to 62.2 miles. It is small and lightweight. It has an emergency power supply, so if we were to lose power during flight, it would be able to use that as a backup. It has a mul multiple payload interfaces, one including a one wire interface, making this design easy to put together. A single antenna, once again, keeping the weight lower than what it would be if we were to use multiple antennas. And lastly, dead reckoning. Dead reckoning means that flight and navigation without GPS is possible. So if our GPS unit were to fail or lose connection or signal, we would still be able to fly. Here I have for you some link analysis. What is link analysis? The definition of link analysis provided is the analysis of power gains and losses that our system experiences while our signal travels from the transmitter to the receiver. Why is this important? Well, this allows us to know how much connectivity we have at different distances by measuring the S and R ratios. Variables used in this analysis was frequency, center frequency, wavelength, and bandwidth. Here to the chart on the right, you can see the frequency was 928 megahertz, the center frequency was 912 megahertz, the wavelength was 30 centimeters, and the bandwidth was 26 megahertz. What I have for you here are the results of my link analysis calculations at various distances of 5 miles, 10 miles, 15 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles, and 40 miles. What I did first was I calculated the power received, and then I converted it to dB watts. As we would expect it to, be, to behave, as the distance increases, so does the, pow the power received decreases. Next, what we have is the thermal noise power. This is found by calculating Boltzmann's constant times the bandwidth used times the temperature. This gave me a value of minus 129.2 dB watts. This value does not change. Using this value and the power received, I was able to calculate the signal to noise ratios. This is probably the most significant value on the chart because depending on its value, we can estimate how well the data is being transmitted by the communication system. For anyone unaware of the significance of the values, an SNR ratio below 15 is a very slow signal. 15 to 24 dB is an average. It's not very high speed. Where you want to be is somewhere above 25 decibels. It'll be fast and reliable. Anything above 40 is even better. As you can see here, even at a 40 mile mission, we have a 25.6 dB SNR ratio, meaning that if we had a mission where we would have to fly out 40 miles, we would have plenty of signal to work with and it would be high speed and reliable. Lastly, what I have is the energy per bit to the spectral noise density. As we would expect, these values are correlate with the signal-to-noise ratios. As the signal-to-noise ratio decreases, so do these values.